Hello, everyone. I'm seeing uh, some of you are still sort of rolling into this event, but perhaps let's get started with our welcome and our introductions. My name is Stephanie Sobek Swand, and I'm the executive director of RIA. Thank you for joining us this evening for RIA's second conversation for conservation of this year. We are so pleased that you can join us tonight along with our guest speaker here, Dr. Vary McFarlane, who is here from the Nature Conservancy of Canada to discuss and tell us about her exciting canoe trip and adventure in Wabakimi Provincial Park. And uh, before I introduce uh, Vary, I would like to acknowledge the territory we are on. The Rare Charitable Research Reserve acknowledges and is grateful to all of the original stewards of the land on which Rare resides within the Haldeman Track, spanning six miles on either side of the Grand River from source to mouth. Understanding that this land has been rich in diverse indigenous presence since time immemorial, there are several indigenous nations that we would like to honor. We would like to honor and respect the sovereignty of both First Nations in our area, the Haudenosaunee people of Six Nations of the Grand River, and the Anishinaabe people of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Niagara and Miigwech to these nations who share their lands with us. We'd also like to acknowledge the neutral peoples and their ancestors, and the indigenous Palio hunters who resided on these lands as long ago as 10,500 years. I would also like to acknowledge those indigenous peoples who currently live, work, and learn in the urban landscape around us, such as other self-identified and status First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. As an organization that is committed to reconciliation with all indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, we recognize that our land acknowledgement is only a first very small step in the process of healing and building better relationships with one another and with the land and waters. We will continue to honor our commitment to reconciliation and truth by continuing to learn more about truth and settler responsibilities, working towards creation of meaningful and systemic change in relationship building that accommodates indigenous collaborators and rare to braid indigenous knowledges and worldviews. And before we start today, I would also like to express my gratitude that we can gather here tonight in freedom and peace, as my heart goes out to those, particularly the people in Ukraine, who continue to suffer from the injustices on the terrors of war, oppression, and outright toxic narcissism. And let's remind ourselves about our own privilege that we enjoy here, and let's not ever take that for granted. Thank you for joining us. And uh, I have the, the great honor tonight to, uh, to introduce Bari, who I've known actually for, for quite a long time now, I think since pretty much 2008, which I think is, is around the time when, when you came to Canada, perhaps Bari. So Vary McFarlane is the Director of Science and Stewardship for the Ontario region of the Nature Conservancy of Canada. She oversees stewardship of NCC properties throughout Ontario and landscape scale planning for property acquisition. She first joined NCC in March 2008 and spent six and a half years as a conservation biologist in southwestern Ontario, where she designed, implemented, and managed field scale restoration of habitat in Norfolk County and on Pelee Island. She grew up in Scotland and holds an honors ecology degree from the University of Stirling and a PhD uh, in ecology from the University of Exeter in Cornwall. Her thesis was on the behavioral ecology of Cape sugarbirds in South Africa. She moved to Ontario in 2006 and had short contracts with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Bird Studies Canada before joining the Nature Conservancy of Canada in March 2008. And after Vary's talk, we will have some time for questions. So if anything piques your interest that you would like to know more about, absolutely um, just type it into our Q&A box, preferably because that's a little bit easier to monitor compared to the chat. And uh, with this, please join me in welcoming Dr. Vary McFarlane. Welcome, Vary. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm just gonna take a couple of seconds to share my screen and then I will hopefully be organized. Okay. So I just want to take a couple of seconds to also acknowledge, um, to acknowledge my status as a visitor everywhere I am, starting in fact right in my home in Scotland. I 
was privileged to grow up exploring wild places from where people had actually been forcibly cleared to make way for sheep farming. And I saw firsthand the ecological impact of that more than 200 years later. And as a recent immigrant to Canada, as Stephanie pointed out, um, I continue to regard myself as a visitor in both time and place. And I strive to do my best to learn about the cultures and people that came before me and surround me today and to treat the lands and pe people with dignity and respect. So I'm excited to um, share with you some of our <laughs> excitement from last summer. Um, hopefully my screen sharing is working OK. Um, so just a quick um, quick introduction to, to who I am. You heard a little bit about this already. Um, I grew up in Scotland. I did a PhD in South Africa on bird behavioral ecology and moved to London, Ontario um, in two, late 2006. And I'm currently working with the Nature Conservancy of Canada. I've been with them since 2008. Um, so that's my kind of um, career, if you like, in a quick nutshell. And the relevant bit for what we're chatting about tonight is that uh, my husband and I started canoeing appropriately enough on Canada Day 2020, um, probably along with many, several hundred other Ontarians that discovered that um, they weren't traveling overseas um, for a while because of the pandemic. Um, so we, we kind of joined everybody else in a canoe and decided to work out this whole um, canoeing business. It was embarrassing. It took us this long to actually get around to that. Um, so why Wabakimi? Um, I'll, I'll get to a bit more explanation as to what it is and where it is in a second. Um, so that first canoe trip we did, um, like many others, we spent five days in Algonquin. Um, later on um, that summer, we did a, a nine day backcountry trip in Quetico Provincial Park up in northwestern Ontario. So, and, and both of those places are absolutely stunning and well worth a visit if you have the opportunity to do so. Um, we, we kind of quite like solitude and things and we, we did run into a few people in Quetico and decided we should maybe try somewhere a little bit quieter and maybe a little bit longer because we actually decided we really liked this canoeing business. Um, so in 2021, the obvious thing, of course, was to spend 18 days in the back country in Wabakimi Provincial Park. Um, now this, of course, does sound really quite rash and irresponsible on the face of it. Um, but it is on the back of a fair amount of um, experience in backcountry wilderness habitat in various parts of the world. Um, this is us doing something silly on mountains in New Zealand, for example. Um, so we have a fair amount of backcountry experience, albeit almost exclusively terrestrial. Um, we also did a um, total of seven days of whitewater instruction in, in, in tandem canoes um, in 2020. We also did our wilderness first aid and all sorts of bits and pieces like that. So it's not, not quite as, as rash as it, as it sounds at first. Um, so I'm going to start off with a fair amount of logistics about the trip. Um, I know some that may appeal to some of you, maybe not so exciting for others, um, but I'll, I'll chat a little bit about that first. Um, and also talk about some of the wildlife encounters that we had and some of the general experiences that we had on, on this trip in, in Wabakimi Provincial Park. So that's a, a bit of a, a sketchbook as to how we ended up getting there, how we, how we made this decision. Um, once we kind of picked out Wabakimi as a, a destination, we did a whole bunch of digging to try to work out like what kind of routes of other people traveled in this place, what is an appropriate route, what kind of timeline do we need? Um, and that involved drawing on, on lots of different resources. Some of them are kind of thrown in here, screen captures. Uh, you'll notice that quite a few of them are not particularly recent. Um, so we were drawing on, on some really fantastic trip pro reports from, from many, many years ago, including a couple of decades ago, at least. Um, but these all gave us really valuable insights into the, the nature of the kind of habitats and landscapes that we would be traveling through and some of the routes that we might want to choose, potentially some of the routes we might want to avoid. Um, and so we assembled this together. Um, and a big part of what we relied on actually was uh, the Wabakimi project. And I do want to take a, a few seconds to just really shout out this particular project called the Wabakimi project. You can Google it and um, learn all about it through the Friends of Wabakimi website, for example. This was essentially a massive volunteer initiative to document canoe routes, portages, and campsites in Wabakimi and the surrounding Crown land. And it involved a huge amount of interaction with uh, local First Nations, individuals, and communities to try to learn about how, how the landscape has been used by people for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. 
Um, and this was initiated by Phil Cotton, the late Phil Cotton in about 2004. And it's really 14 years of really dedicated volunteer effort. You can see some of the stats listed there. Um, it really is quite a stupendous amount of, of effort um, to, to document and to map and physically visit all of these, these um, really cool routes. And in total, I think they estimated they mapped around 270 kilometers of portage, uh, many of which we then um, used to, to kind of plan our route. Um, so it's worth checking out that website and learning a bit more about that if you're interested. Um, so yeah, thank you to the Friends of Wabakimi and the Wabakimi Project for and all of those volunteers for this effort. So a lot of that kind of turned into various maps that you can acquire again also often through Friends of Wabakimi. You can purchase various maps and guides through, through them. We used a website called Paddle Planner, which helps you kind of plot routes on a, on a map and gives you a route that you can kind of spit out and, and stick onto a, a navigation device, which we'll chat a bit more about later. Um, we also got various um, map layers from, from various websites. And um, I shouldn't really say we, because my husband did most of this work. I was kind of busy birding or I don't know, doing something else. Uh, but he did a huge amount of digging to put all of this stuff together. And one key point that was pretty interesting, you can see from the map in the bottom right corner, it's, it's a really complex landscape. There's a whole bunch of lakes, but also a whole bunch of, of rivers and creeks and things. And so obviously water is in fact flowing. And this seems like a really obvious thing to say, but it's quite useful to know which direction the water is actually flowing. It's not always super apparent from such a complex landscape when you're looking at the map, which direction everything's going in. Um, and it was kind of helpful to know just how many days we're actually going to be paddling upstream as opposed to downstream. Um, so we kind of assembled all of this information as best we could and, and kind of the mixture of scanning and PowerPoint and cutting and pasting, moving stuff around, kind of assembled our own maps with as much information as we could glean from those various guides and, and trip reports I mentioned earlier. Um, so we created a whole series of paper maps like this one um, with little insets showing in, you know, information about potential campsites, information about some of the rapids on the rivers, um, and bits and pieces about portages and things where we had that information. Um, so we ended up with a whole series of maps, you know, 18 days covers, you, you can cover a lot of ground on that. It's about 300 kilometers that we covered in total. So it was quite a lot of maps. Um, we had a backup copy of all of these kind of buried in one of our dry bags and one set for the day kind of in, in the canoe with us. Um, so we also used a, a piece of software called Gaia GPS, um, which is a really cool um, software that you can, you can log in and set up an account. And for about $20 a year and an annual sus subscription, you can actually download maps um, onto your phone so that you can use them when you're, you're offline out, out of cell phone range. <clears throat> so we did that. And of course, we um, didn't rely on that for navigation. We, we had two copies of our paper maps, as I mentioned. Um, kept the, most of them dry and buried in a, a safe bag and just had the ones that we needed for the day out to hand. A little bit of kind of health and safety logistics as well. We also carried a Garmin inReach. It's a little device that connects to our cell phones and allows us to send messages to say to friends and family that we're safe in the campsite for the night. Um, and we could also communicate back and forth to the local outfitter who could send us weather reports and things like that should we, should we need it. Um, so the picture on the right is just kind of a screen capture of the whole route that we took from, from south to north, um, and that's kind of a screen capture from Gaia GPS. Um, zoomed in a little bit further, you can see the kind of level of detail that you can actually have right on your phone screen or GPS as you go, which is actually really handy for some of these really complex landscapes that we find ourselves in. Um, I'll talk about all of the other random red blobs later. Um, you're probably wondering how on earth you thought I could cope with the cell phone in the back country, but we um, kitted ourselves out with this cool little solar panel and some, some backup um, battery packs. So we're actually able to use our phones for, for kind of navigational aids throughout the whole 18 days. Um, I was using them for documenting birds and wildlife that I'll talk about later. I used them for an awful lot of the photos that you will see as well. Um, so it was actually quite straightforward to keep them, keep them going for that trip talk about a little bit more of the logistics around that lately, later. Um, so more logistics, um, in terms of food, um, we had 18 days, two humans, no cats, despite Kitty McCatface's best attempt to join us. 
Um, so we reckon we had about 30 kilos of dehydrated food. So this is um, food that we cooked at home and, and dehydrated ourselves and vacuum sealed into kind of packs for, for every night. Um, of course, um, it was important to have some adult beverages as well. So we, we decanted a bottle of port and a bottle of bourbon into these um, flexible platypus bladders. Um, as you might surmise in a few slides, that the trip was actually so arduous that we ended up bringing quite a lot of that back because we didn't have very much downtime to actually enjoy it. But um, it's nice to have a little treat in the wilderness sometimes. Um, and each night, wherever possible, we hung all of our food and, and sort of smelly scented items in, in dry bags and trees in a pulley system so that we could keep them out of reach of bears. Um, the problem is that quite a lot of the landscape that we traveled through didn't have very many standing trees. It had either been recently burned or the trees were such that you, they just didn't have big heavy branches that were suitable for making a, a suitable bear hang. Um, and in those situations, we just stashed the food kind of away from the, the campsite and we didn't actually have any problems at all. So, um, so where is this place that I keep going on about? Um, so it's way the heck up there. So it's um, a few hours north of Thunder Bay in northwestern Ontario. So it's a good, good two days of driving. Um, so we're based in London. Um, we left on the 19th of June, stayed in Sault Ste. Marie in the way with some friends, and then continued up to Matisse Lake Outfitters just outside of Armstrong um, at, and got dropped off to start paddling um, on the 21st of June. Now, those of you that are familiar with, with bug season in Ontario will be thinking that we're completely and utterly crazy because that really is peak bug o'clock. Um, but I'll kind of talk a little bit about why that is a little bit later and I've given a little bit of a clue there. Um, so yeah, so that's where we went. Um, in terms of our boat, um, we kind of really jumped in hard into this whole canoeing business and, and invested in, in two canoes, in fact. Um, but this is the boat that we took for this trip. It's an H2O Voyageur, 17-foot um, canoe. Um, it's about 25 to 27 kilograms, um, which isn't my problem because Brent carries it. Um, it's actually made locally in Tavistock, so um, super local, um, really, really nice boat that we, we really enjoyed on some pretty pretty rough low water level conditions that survived very well and hasn't needed any repairs at all. Um, so it's, it's a really good, much much lightweight, much lighter weight alternative to um, traditional Royal X canoes, for example. Um, so yeah, so this is the, the very start of our trip at the very, very south end of Little Caribou Lake, um, boat loaded up, ready to go. Um, and again, for those of you that are gear nuts like my husband is, um, that's a, a rough breakdown of the, the kind of different bags and things that we had. A couple of big 100 litre um, dry bags for the bulk of our stuff. Um, two backpacks, um, camera bags, of course, little thwart bag for odds and ends and emergencies and three paddles, so a, a spare paddle. And that fitted pretty nicely into our 17 foot boat. Um, just the two of us, no cats came. Um, so it was pretty spacious. So just a little bit more in the way of um, gear tips and tricks. I've mentioned already that I, I use, well, both of us, we used our smartphones a fair amount for um, photographs and documenting natural history and, and for a little bit of navigational aids as well. Um, so how you can make that happen in the back country is simply keep it on airplane mode and some phones also have a battery saver mode as well. Um, and that really ekes out battery life. We could keep the, the phones going for two, sometimes three days, depending on how many photos we're taking. Um, if you're use, using it for navigation and some of the other natural history apps I'll talk about, then just make sure that the GPS system on your phone is, is enabled. Um, we have these um, battery packs, which um, would do kind of, I forget, kind of five or six charges of those phones. Um, and of course, a lanyard so that when we're waving it around in wet conditions, we can always remain attached to it. Um, so I've mentioned, alluded to this a little bit. I was um, using eBird and iNaturalist a lot. Um, I do this a lot in the back country, especially. And I just gathered all of that data on the phone and submitted all of that those checklists and information back once I got back home to my Wi-Fi connection um, back in London. Um, and yeah, I already mentioned we spare battery pack um, and the solar charging system that we could actually lay it out in the canoe while we were paddling and kind of charge things up on days when we weren't paddling on, on rapids um, and days when it wasn't windy or hang up at the campsite and charge things up um, at the end of the day. 
um, a little bit more on camera gear and stuff. Um, I've been tripping with my DSLR camera, which so far touch wood seems to have been going okay. Um, I keep it inside its holster, which pads it from, from knocks and jolts. Um, and that in turn sits inside this dry bag tote thing, which I have in front of me and in, in the front of the canoe. Um, and everything is kind of closed up and carabinered onto the boat whenever things are a bit sketchy, like if we're doing paddling rapids or it gets a bit windy and in camera conditions or situations where we think we're likely to encounter wildlife, then I'll have it a little bit more ready to use. And again, I shouldn't say this, touch wood, so far so good. Um, it's also important to have an auto steer, in this case, in the farmer Brandt. Um, he is very good at, and very patient at steering the boat so that we can keep away from wildlife so, so as to avoid disturbing it, um, but also kind of keep me in position so that I can get, get photos of, of things to submit to iNaturalist and eBird. So um, finally getting into some, some scenery shots and things in the park. Um, so this is the, the whole uh, 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 a map showing the whole route that we took. We started in Little Caribou Lake. You can drive right to there. Um, we were dropped off by our outfitter in a truck at the end of the road there. Um, and we got in and paddled north basically for 18 days um, right up to Miminiska Lake. And that there were picked up by a float plane from our, our outfitter and he flew us right the way back, not quite over our route, just east of where we actually paddled. Um, and you can see roughly some of the names of the lakes that, lakes and, and um, features that we paddled through. Um, the, the bulk of the, the kind of middle part of the trip um, is all in Wabakimi Provincial Park itself. The first day actually was not, it was on Crown Land on the outside. And then a whole chunk was on the Mishikawa River, which is actually not protected. Um, and then the Mishikawa feeds into the Albany River, which is um, the banks of the Albany are protected by a provincial park. Um, and then Miminiska Lake is effectively a part of the, the Albany River. It's just where it kind of widens out quite significantly. Um, so in terms of other visitors, there are several fly and fishing rod lodges throughout the park. Um, this was at a point where um, the border with the US was still in fact closed. So many of those lodges were actually closed um, and closed up and had been for the whole of 2020 as well. Um, in normal years, the, country, the, the park only sees around 700 backcountry visitors per year, which is tiny given how, how colossal the park actually is. Um, and we actually saw no humans whatsoever between day two and day 16 on our trip. So um, it was it was definitely quiet, uh, probably quieter than usual because of COVID. But um, from an Ontario perspective, it is pretty far away, pretty remote, um, although it is quite close to, to quite a lot of large population centers in the US. Um, but it still doesn't seem to see that many visitors. Um, and this is my camera bag sitting on one of those um, fishing boats that's set up between two little lakes. That fishing boat had been kind of upside down like that for um, probably a, a season and a half and a whole winter in between because nobody had been in to, to, to fish in those areas. Um, so we, we had the opportunity to have some really cool scenery scenic and wildlife encounters throughout the whole the whole trip. Um, quite a lot of the trip was didn't involve a whole lot of downtime and it was just the two of us. So all of the kind of camp setup and camp tear down and dealing with portages and navigating was obviously falling on just the two of us. So it ends up being quite a lot of work and some of that work would be perhaps relieved if you had a slightly bigger party. Um, but this is one of the beautiful sunsets. I think this is one of the first nights, the first few days of the whole trip was super, super windy. So we we're paddling into a headwind for about five or six days and ended up losing quite a lot of time. And I think this was one of the first days where the wind finally stopped and the water was beautifully calm and everything just felt suddenly perfect again. Um, so it was a, a really beautiful evening. Um, so in terms of portages, we I, I can't remember how many actual portages we, we made use of, but um, all of them were pretty short um, and they're maintained by a, a um, sort of a couple of four, a couple of four, four member team partnerships with um, First Nation communities. So there's several First Nation communities kind of in that whole area around the park and the surrounding lands. Um, and there's quite a few individuals from, from those communities that are hired and 
maintain the portages every year. So it's such a huge area and there's so many kilometers to paddle and to maintain that there's kind of a, a rotation across the years. So a given portage may only be maintained every two or three years, something like that. Um, which is actually really cool. It works really well. It, it keeps the, the real kind of wilderness experience, if you like, in the park. Um, of course, that does mean that you, you should expect to encounter some portages that have not seen humans for two years and may have experienced quite a lot of wind in the, in the interim. Um, so this is a beautiful uh, trail in this photo here. Um, really, you can ask for, for better maintenance on that. Um, Unfortunately, some of the portages looked a little bit more like this. Um, and this is absolutely not a criticism of, of the teams that work so hard to maintain these portages. This had been a fairly recent significant wind event, we think. Um, and it was like, like a tornado potentially had gone through here and just lifted the trees and thrown them all back down like a, a matchbox had been dropped on the floor. It was extraordinary. Um, you can see quite a lot of these trees are actually still very green, so I think it had been at least relatively recent, although I acknowledge that conifers can take a while to turn brown even once they're dead. Um, so fortunately we knew that this was likely to happen and likely to be something we encountered, so we, we were more or less equipped to deal with this. We had a nice little axe, but we stupidly did not bring a sharpening stone for the axe, and that is definitely something we will always bring again. Um, we had this fantastic little folding saw, um, which came out of the park several inches shorter than it went into the park because we used it so extensively. We kept bring, breaking the tip off. Um, and something that no one really talks about necessarily is, is work gloves. Work gloves are, are really helpful for this kind of silly activity in the back country, it turns out. Um, I can't even remember taking that photo of the, the canoe on the right there. It was just one of those arduous days that kind of blurred into my memory. Um, but we, we kind of did our best to create a route so that we could get our stuff through fairly conveniently, but also make it convenient and, and easy for other people that might be coming along behind us. So if you wanted to do this route, then immediately after we did it, would have been a really, really good time to do it. Um, who knows now? Um, probably some, some more wind events have occurred and reclosed some of those portages, but um, we did our best to, to make it clear for, for others coming. Um, quite a lot of the downfalls were just simple individual trees across the footpath, just like this. Um, the bottom picture is, is a bit more complicated. The, the, the trees, as you can see, are growing on bedrock. There's hardly any soil in some of these places. And when a tree blows over, it kind of pulls up this whole mat of sphagnum moss and things. Um, and it, it makes you wonder how these trees manage to persist in that habitat at all. Um, but this was a kind of thing that we had to kind of saw our way through that kind of mat of, of sphagnum and, and peat and things so that we could create a route for the that it was wide enough to pull the canoe through. Um, this was probably our most arduous day. Um, it took us about seven hours to move over only a kilometer of portage. Um, so clearing the portage and then moving our stuff. There was a 750 meter stretch and then a very sharp paddle and then another 350 meters. And excluding the paddling in the middle, that, that whole section took us seven hours. And we had a bit of paddling before and after that seven hours as well. So it ended up being an extremely long day. Um, fortunately, we got to stop for lunch partway through um, on our cute little stick stove. Um, and the very end of the last portage that particular day was a fairly famous one. It's a, a portage down into Rock Cliff Lake. Um, and it really is a rock cliff. Um, so we had to lower the canoe on some ropes, not quite vertically, but pretty steeply down. It's really hard to capture how steep it really was um, down into the lake. Um, and that was quite a sting in the tail, which fortunately we knew was coming and we were prepared for it, but um, it was still quite a good a good end to a, an arduous part of the trip and we had about I think five or ten kilometers to paddle still after that before there would be a suitable campsite it was a this was the really the start of the Michikaya River in some ways it's, it's pretty narrow steep sided so really not any flat ground beside the water and we eventually did find a spot to camp in at quarter to ten at night um, when it was starting to get dark and it was very much bug o'clock um, so that was an extremely long day. Um, but very rewarding, really beautiful, lots of cool birds singing their little heads off all around us the whole time and really nice plants and things like that that I'll get into later. Um, so I mentioned bugs a little bit um, and the dates that we, we chose, 21st of June to the 8th of July. And yeah, we absolutely had them all. We had black flies, we had mosquitoes, we had deer flies, we even had a few stable flies as well. So we really had the entire mix. 
Um, and this is a photo of the, the inside of the fly of our tent. So there's mesh between me and all of those mosquitoes, but that was a, a fairly mosquito-y morning where the mosquitoes had come in under the, the fly sheet on the tent to kind of roost for the night. And we're hoping to get at those, those warm blooded things that were inside the tent. Um, I really love black flies. They do really good things to my face. Um, this was this happened on like day two or something like that. So I spent day three not really being able to see where it was paddling, but fortunately Brent could steer, so that didn't really matter. Um, so we we have one of these Eureka no bug zone shelters, which is actually really neat. Um, it's from a hiking perspective, it seems like a ridiculous luxury because it would never carry basically two tents. Um, but when you're canoeing, then the boat does it for you. So it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, so if you're well, venturing into the back country at, at this time of year, um, then it's, it's, it's a really good recommendation to, to think about getting one of these. Um, we used a paddle joiner, so we could use our a couple of our paddles as a, a tent pole to hold up one end of it. Um, and it actually worked as a really good rain shelter as well. This was the one rain shower that we got caught in um, on the whole trip, in fact. Um, and it was actually really good for, for, we could kind of cook in there and organize our stuff and watch the world go by. Um, and we actually got visited by a very large bull moose. He came wandering along the beach and got a heck of a fright when he saw that there were a couple of primates inside this, this weird tent thing that had appeared in his habitat. Um, so, um, so finally getting to the reason why we chose such a stupid time to go into the backcountry in Northern Ontario um, is that we wanted to contribute to the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas. Um, so this is an, an in initiative that's, that runs for five years at a time, every 20 years or so in Ontario, and it occurs in other provinces as well, but right now it's Ontario's turn. Um, so last year was the first year of the five-year effort to collect data on breeding birds throughout the province. Um, so the whole province is divided into squares that are 10 by 10 kilometers, and you may have noticed them on some of the earlier screenshots that I showed, but you can see these kind of faint squares on the, the map of our route here. So we passed through a lot of breeding bird atlas squares, um, and the idea is that volunteers like you and I can go out and survey um, birds during, during the breeding season um, for each species and document where the birds are, how many there are, whether they're breeding successfully, things like that. And these data are really important to inform um, knowledge about trends in bird populations and to start informing what kind of conservation intervention organizations like the Rare Charitable Research Reserve, the Nature Conservancy of Canada and everyone else, I um, mean yourselves right at home as well, could be doing to, to try to um, help conserve birds. Um, so this is something that, that you can all contribute to if you're interested. Um, if you haven't come across it, then I encourage you to Google Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas. You'll find all the information on the website about how you can sign up as a volunteer. And you don't have to go into the, the back country like this to contribute. You can contribute from your own backyard or your park in the, the town or anywhere you are in Ontario over the next few years. Um, the volunteer effort using your, your eyes and your ears is augmented by um, automatic recording units or ARUs. Um, and these are um, little devices also called song meters, which are pre-programmed to record bird song um, for short birds bursts at dawn and dusk. So we borrowed uh, two of these um, for our trip and I got taught how to use them via Zoom, um, used an app on my phone to kind of set them up each evening. And we could set them up um, kind of near our campsites each night and they would come on by themselves in the morning and, and record bird songs. So I didn't always have to get up at four in the morning to, to try and count birds myself because it was a machine doing it stuck to a tree each night. Um, so in theory, we're supposed to install them kind of around 200 meters away from kind of the edge of things. So the idea is to really sample what birds are singing and any other creatures that are making noise, of course, but primarily the focus is on birds, um, sort of in the middle of each type of habitat. Now, in some cases, that was fairly straightforward. Um, picture up on the left is a, an area that was burned relatively recently. Um, so it was fairly easy to walk a fair distance up from the edge of the water. Um, however, the um, the photo on the right um, is a bit of a more typical landscape that we find ourselves in quite a few times. Um, this was also an area that had been burned, but a little bit longer ago, so it had been growing back much more densely and it was super, super difficult um, to move through. And you think that 
200 meters is nothing. Of course, you can move 200 meters, but it's really hard to move 200 meters with any degree of speed and accuracy in that kind of habitat. Um, so that's just another shot of the song meter. You can tie it around using these cool um, handy dandy gear loops around either a big tree or in this case, a kind of wobbly little shrubby alder thing um, and just leave them to, to do the thing. Um, so um, I augmented the data that the song meters were busy collecting um, while I was mostly sleeping um, with a whole bunch of eBird checklists. So those of you that aren't familiar with eBird, it's uh, basically a, a community science um, effort to collect, or it's an online database that stores and collects data on birds all over the planet. So anywhere you are in the world, if you see a bird, or even if you don't see a bird, but you're actually looking for a bird for a certain period of time, you can submit that information to eBird and those data get um, and processed and they're available for conservationists and researchers again to help us better understand the distribution and movement patterns of birds globally um, and feeds into to our, our ability to conserve them. Um, so I, I made about 100, 139 eBird checklists during the course of our paddling. Um, so it was just paddling along, kind of either listening or, or watching birds and trying to document everybody um, with a focus on looking to see if they were doing something that suggested they were actually breeding. Um, so those dates that we picked, peak bug o'clock, um, is the peak of breeding activity at that latitude in Ontario. So that's really the time that you need to be in those habitats, feeding yourselves to all of the biting insects so that you can actually document what the birds are up to. Because any later than that, then birds start to move around, territories break down, young birds start flying around, and it can be really hard to tell where that breeding activity actually occurred. And that's really important to know if something is breeding somewhere, then that's a really important place to potentially conserve or to learn a little bit more about what it is that might that, that bird might need about breeding habitat. So some quick examples of what that might look like. And these are things you can look for in your own backyard or on your, your, you know, your dog walk in the, the evening or whatever it is. Um, this is a flicker, a northern flicker that, that showed up in our campsite one of the early nights actually. And he was excavating that hole that you can just see above his feet. Now, this is kind of woodpecker. They actually excavate holes in trees, and that's where he, he would be planning to nest. Um, so this is a really good, um, good solid bit of, of evidence that is a good chance, is a probability that, that that species is breeding at that site at that point in time. Another example was this northern water thrush. Um, we were moving our stuff along a portage, and every time we got to the end and put our bags down, ready to load the boat, this bird would pop up and start screaming at us. Um, so I suspect that there was either a nest nearby or maybe some, some recently fledged young that were kind of skulking in the bushes, and this adult bird was really agitated. Um, so of course, we did our best to give it, give it its space and moved away as quickly as possible, but we were able to document that agitated behavior as being, again, a probable evidence of breeding. Um, some other things that you can see is if you see something like a, a bird that you know is in, in the right kind of habitat at the right time of year, then if that's all you see, that's still fine. That's still some level of evidence. Um, this is also known as possible breeding evidence. This was a, a com common golden eye female that was um, bobbing around in the river. We didn't see any chicks with her, but we did see lots of chicks a bit later on. And in fact, the Michikai River looks like an incredibly important place for golden eye. We saw so many rafts of, of females with kind of six, eight, ten babies bobbing along beside her. Um, kind of one of the more exciting species that we documented, I guess, was trumpeter swans. Um, these are a bird that have kind of been reintroduced and, and re-spread back into Ontario naturally um, after having been extra, extirpated for quite some time now. So you can see these birds increasingly commonly in southern Ontario, but um, it was really neat to see them um, really in the back of beyond up here with um, a nice raft of little babies bobbing along. And of course that's confirmed breeding evidence. It doesn't get any more confirmed than that if you've got adult birds and baby birds right there as well. Um, so the other thing that I was busy um, contributing data to was iNaturalist. So again, this is a similar concept to eBird. It's a global database that documents all living things. So eBird is just birds, um, but iNaturalist will, will take information on any living species, or in fact, also dead individuals as well. Um, 
so it's a really cool thing. It's maybe a little more accessible for beginners than eBird might be. Um, all you need is a, a camera or a smartphone. You can grab a photo, even a fairly crappy photo of you know a dandelion popping up through a crack in the sidewalk. If you upload the photo to iNaturalist, it uses artificial intelligence to come up with a likely identification for you for that species that you've seen. You can then submit it um, and say, yeah, I think iNaturalist, I think you're probably right. I think it's probably a dandelion, but I'm not sure. You can submit it as a dandelion. And then there's an online community of volunteer um, people, some of whom are, are amazing experts, and some of them are, are you know, unpaid amateurs that are also really, really good. And they will look at your photo, look at where you saw it, look at the time of year that you saw it, and they will also suggest further identifications to that thing until eventually, if there's consensus, then your observation is, is considered to be identified, it's considered research grade, and is then available again for researchers, conservationists, um, to help us understand the, the distribution of species around the world. So again, using, using my phone just on airplane mode, I was able to add about 175 observations to the, the park project, and which is quite satisfying. So if you look on iNaturalist, um, all of the provincial parks are set up there as a separate project. So you can see um, where each park sits on the leaderboard. And I was actually able to kind of bump um, Wabakimi Provincial Park kind of up the leaderboard a little bit. And that's kind of fun to do if you have a favorite provincial park. Um, spoiler alert, Algonquin Provincial Park is already at the top, so it's hard to, to change anything there. I just need to grab some more water. So not only is this kind of a fun thing where you can set goals for yourself and kind of play around and see where you, you stand on these things, but it is actually really helpful for land managers to be able to see what kind of species you're seeing, how many visitors are visiting and, and documenting things on iNaturalist and things like that. It really is a good, good way to kind of turn a, a random walk in the park into something that actually contributes to our, our understanding of, of species distribution and something you can try out at home um, right away. Um, so yeah, so as I mentioned, I can collect observations in airplane mode. Um, it's probably a good idea to not drop the phone. Um, <laughs> hence the lanyard that I mentioned earlier, everything's always tied on to somewhere. Um, and you can document everything. You can document plants, mammals, mollusks, invertebrates. We, we managed to photograph one single snake in our whole trip, um, a, a really pretty garter snake. Um, this is my first ever Luna moth. I'd never seen them before. Um, so I was able to document all of these things on iNaturalist and it was, it was kind of fun. And just a quick note to that, um, if you have a smartphone, um, but you also have uh, an independent camera, like a, like the DSLR that I mentioned earlier, you can take photos with your proper camera and then still document the observation through iNaturalist. You can just take a quick photo of the back of your big camera. Um, and then when you get back to, to internet connectivity and process your, your better quality photos, you can kind of swap the photos out. But you still use the phone to document the location and the time and the date and things like that of wherever it was you observed. And um, so it's kind of a fun trick there. And so it was a good idea to have a backup notebook. Um, you may think I'm awfully dependent on technology, but we always have backups because we know that things get dropped and things stop working and all of those, those things. Um, so now I have a, a series of photos of just some of the cool creatures that we, we got to see. Um, this is a really crappy photo, unfortunately, but we were extremely excited to catch up with our first ever woodland caribou. Um, this is a species at risk in, in Ontario and in fact across Canada. Um, this was a female with her calf. Um, so the other thing I hadn't really thought about before we planned this trip is that we actually were coinciding with the time just after calves had been born. So females tend to swim out to fairly small islands on big lakes to give birth um, in order to try and reduce the likelihood of encountering wolves, which tend to predate, especially the calves. Um, and so once they've given birth and kind of they've, they've found their feet, then they will then swim them to other islands and other, other areas that are you know, relatively far from where wolves tend to find them. And so it's a great, great time of year to actually be able to see them swimming between some of these islands. Um, so this was actually one of the early days when it was super, super windy, and we were really struggling to keep the canoe both upright and pointing in the direction that we wanted to go in. Um, but Brent was extremely generous with his muscle power and was able to more or less hold the canoe steady while I grabbed some photos. Now that the animals were 
they must have been three or four hundred meters away or something like that. This is a, a 400 mil zoom zoom lens and I've then further cropped the image so we were very far away from these animals. Um, but it was a real privilege to see them. We, we saw them, I think, on one other occasion on the trip and Wabakimi Provincial Park and the surrounding area actually is a really important place for this species in, in an Ontario context um, and can be a good place to, to actually see them. Um, we saw quite a lot of American black bears like this guy. Um, this was actually a bear that I ended up a bit too close to completely unintentionally. It was a, a bit of a windy day and we'd gotten stuck because um, we had to round a headland and to get around that headland we we're going to be in really winds angles that we couldn't cope with so we just sat it out for a few hours and I kind of got bored and wandered off birding um, and as I was tracking down a, a little warbler that was carrying some food to its nestling then I heard some crashing in the undergrowth which was not Brent it turned out to be a bear um, so we had a little chat about how I was not delicious and how it should probably go away now please and then it did which was quite a relief. Um, I should mention that we did have bear spray and, and whistles and things like that, so we were um, doing our best to be as responsible as we could and always aim to give wildlife as much of a, a much space as we possibly can. This was a, a really random chance encounter. Um, we also saw huge numbers of moose. Uh, this is a beautiful um, bull moose that was, um, again, unfortunately, as I mentioned, we, we try to give wildlife as much space as we can, but this was on the Michikai River and we were paddling with the current and it's a relatively narrow stretch of river that's also really quite bendy. Um, so we'd be kind of paddling along really gently and suddenly there'd be a moose exploding in front of us. Um, and we came across, I think, three or four bull moose doing exactly that as we're paddling the stretch of the Michikau and also quite a few bears in a similar context. So we're able to, to grab some quick photos and they kind of crashed off into the undergrowth and continued with their, with their day. We didn't see very many otters, but towards the end of our trip, we caught up with I think three or four separate groups of them just in this kind of kilometer stretch of, of river on the Albany River. Um, I guess the kind of texture of the, the muddy banks there was apparently just right to set up home for otters. So um, this little guy was fairly curious, but most of the others kind of disappeared without trace fairly quickly. Um, I mentioned we, we actually saw two snakes. This was the only one that I got a decent photo of. It was a particularly colorful Eastern garter snake. It was a really, really pretty snake that was basking um, quite, quite conveniently just near our campsite one, one morning and gave us some really good looks. Um, lots of really interesting wildflowers. So twin flower is a, it's a very common boreal plant, but they were in peak condition when we were there. It was the, the forest floor was absolutely carpeted in these tiny little bell flowers, um, often growing on kind of fallen logs like this cluster. Um, really, really pretty to see. I was super excited to catch up with this plant. This is a species I'd never seen before, tall bluebells. Um, there is a species of bluebell called Carolina bluebells down here in southwestern Ontario. It's pretty unusual. I haven't seen it in the wild very often down here, but this was a, a very similar looking species um, that occurs in kind of northern and, and western Ontario and beyond. So this was in some particularly rich woods around Iron Falls on our, our trip. Our very last morning, we got to see our only American white pelicans. Uh, those of you that maybe aren't familiar with this, it kind of blew me away when I realized this actually quite recently, um, that American white pelicans actually breed in the boreal. Um, they're not just a, a wacky tropical bird that you see when you go to Florida or whatever. They, um, this species actually breeds in, in boreal bogs and wetlands and, and really quite remote habitat. We didn't come across any nests. This was just a big flock that were kind of loafing around the edge of the lake near our very last campsite. And then, you know, kind of mid morning, they all kind of took off and kettled around in the, the air above us and flew off. So that was a real treat to see them. Um, just a little bit of note about the, the paddling itself, which I guess maybe I should have started with. Um, this is the Ogoki River and um, we paddled this nice little rapid here. Um, you'll see from all of the bare rock along the side that the water levels were actually fairly low. And I understand that they were perhaps a little unusually low even for the time of year that we were there. So um, quite a few of the, the rapids were a bit of a bump and a grind, which wasn't very pleasant and the boat wasn't terribly happy with that, but it remained completely intact, although it's now very scratched. Um, so this is a fun little stretch. It also meant that um, we had some 
pretty crappy choices to have to make occasionally. And um, I think this is the early reaches of the Michikau River, um, which is pretty rocky and lumpy and not super pleasant looking to paddle. And so we actually walked down the stretch of the river along the edge, trying to scout the rapids, trying to make a decision about whether we would paddle it or not. And if we did, which line we would take. Um, and we thought, well, it's kind of crappy, but we're not sure we actually really want to paddle that. So maybe we'll take the portage instead. And the portage route was marked as cutting that corner that you can see here. So it cut across a little headland. And we started trying to follow the portage to get back to where we'd left the boat. And we basically could not find the portage at all. Because again, it was one of these situations where there'd been a fire probably about a decade or more ago, perhaps. Um, and then a whole bunch of windstorms and goodness knows what else. And the portage was just completely impossible to, to even imagine navigating with a boat and a bunch of heavy bags. So we ended up walking back up the river and then doing a kind of bump and grind down the stretch of the river, which basically means we paddle for a few meters, hit a rock because there was no water, and then get out and lift the boat over, drag the boat over, and then get back in and paddle through the deeper ponds and things, or deeper kind of pools. Um, so that was that was perhaps one of the lower moments on this trip was trying to navigate through these really, really rather low water levels with the, the terrestrial part being also really unattractive. Um, speaking of low water levels, we also um, got to um, demonstrate that PFDs work really well in mud as well as water. Um, so this was a big kind of pond, slow moving streamy area on Webster Creek. And we basically bottomed out because it turned out that it was only two or three inches of water on top of bottomless mud. Um, and it's really hard trying to paddle through mud, it turns out. So Brent thought, oh, I'll just jump out and push the boat. And that was a really bad idea. Um, everyone survived. We got out eventually, but it was a very muddy experience. Again, as a result of fairly somewhat unusually low water levels for the time of year. Um, this was also a point, um, if you remember, cast your minds back to the weather in Ontario and in fact beyond Ontario last summer um, was a time when there were a lot of forest fires um, right across the boreal zone. Um, and I looked up the, the, the high temperatures in Armstrong for the duration of our trip after we got back. So the highs went from high of 14 for the first week. That was probably when we were paddling into a headwind and it was not 14 degrees where we were. <laughs> I think it was substantially colder. Um, but then it peaked at 35 degrees, which more or less coincided with those really arduous portage clearing days that we had that I've already talked about. And then the temperature dropped back down to about 18 towards the end. Um, so this is a point, this photo was kind of in the middle of the trip, but it was super hot and super smoky as well. So we could smell wood smoke really close. Um, the air was really thick. And if we'd been able to stay awake long enough to watch the sunsets, I'm sure they would have been really beautiful because the sun was setting through this really, really smoky atmosphere. Um, and we didn't really know how close these fires were. Like, although we, we were able to communicate with our outfitter, we were kind of deliberately not trying to get news and frequent weather updates and things like that. Part of the point of these trips for us is to switch off. Um, and we knew that we could trust the outfitter that he would communicate with us and come and get us if there was actually a problem that meant that we were in danger. But nonetheless, we're kind of wondering how far away these fires actually were. And it, it turned out that I think what we were smelling was mostly from Woodland Caribou Provincial Park, which I think did get really badly burned last summer. Um, so this is kind of an academically exciting spot, but really rather boring photo. This is where the Michikai River joins the Albany River. So the Albany flows from your left to your right, and the Michikai is flowing from behind me down into the Albany. Um, so this was a good kind of point in the trip. We knew that after that we'd have a whole bunch more water and that, um, that hopefully some of the rapids would be a bit more fun and a bit easier to, to paddle and we wouldn't have to worry quite so much about bumping and grinding over rocks that really should be further underwater. Um, and then right at the very last day where trustee float plane came back to pick us up, um, we again, as I mentioned, we were communicating with the outfitter. He, sent, he knew where we were. We did in fact manage to get there right on time despite our, our heavy headwinds for the first week or so. Um, and the float plane arrived right on time. And then we climbed into it and got flown out over um, almost for a full hour across this most incredible landscape. Um, and it was actually, I actually find it quite emotional in some ways because it, I knew that I knew exactly what that landscape was like having just spent 18 days kind of 
sometimes fighting my way through it and, and learning to love it and appreciating all of the, the smells and the sounds and the, the amazing wildlife encounters and things that we had and the incredible solitude. And flying back over it, knowing that that whole landscape was protected forever was, was really quite heartening um, and something that I, I do try to, to kind of keep with me and keep in mind. And um, when we have all sorts of crappy things happening all around the world, really traumatic things happening on our doorsteps and further afield right now, then it's, it is comforting to remember that there are some of these incredibly special places right here on our doorstep in Ontario um, that we can in fact visit. Some of them are harder work than others to visit, but we, we do have the privilege to be able to access these incredible places. Um, and with that, I will be happy to take any questions or, or chat about the, the trip, um, depending on what's shown up in the chat. Thank you for coming and thanks for your attention. Well, thank you so much, Bari. Um, I was told there are issues with the Q&A box. So if people would just like to uh, put their questions in the chat instead, uh, I think I will be able to see them, hopefully. So would you consider to, to go on this trip again, Vari, or, or what are your plans for the next big trip, I guess? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it, 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 was, it was undoubtedly an arduous trip. Um, like, like we're reasonably fit and used to doing silly things in the outdoors over the years, although we are getting older and less fit. But um, even in the grand scheme of things, it was definitely hard work, um, definitely quite mentally challenging sometimes, um, just the two of us trying to deal with our stuff and deal with portage clearing and stuff is definitely hard work. Um, but that brings huge rewards as well. You know, it's, it's, it's really hard to describe the rewards that that, that gives you. Um, and being able to spend time in these incredibly beautiful places and seeing these cool animals and birds and plants is, is, is really incredible. So, um, and I think we probably would do that trip again. I mean, another year, the water levels will be different. It could be a completely different experience. You know, I heard some people cleared the portages, so it's probably going to be really easy next time, right? <laughs> um, so, um, but there's also, I mean, we, 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 we did kind of traverse the whole park, but it's an absolutely massive provincial park. Um, so there's lots of other routes that, that we'd like to do there. Um, we are hoping to contribute further to the Breeding Bird Atlas by doing another kind of remote Northern Ontario canoe trip. Things are still a bit up in the air with that right now because um, COVID is really ripping really badly through a lot of First Nations communities in Northern Ontario right now. So understandably, they have much more important things to worry about than um, whether they can host and support um, a bunch of birders like us. So. Um, hopefully we'll be able to pull something off that, that involves not draining resources in, in these northern communities, but we'll see what, what the summer begin, brings, but certainly some kind of adventure somewhere with birds, somewhere with a canoe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Barry, uh, we have a couple of people asking how many different species of birds uh, did you observe during the trip? Oh, no, that's a good question. I don't actually know exactly. Um, how many species of bird? Um, huh. Lots. <laughs> um, I would say kind of between 30 and 50 would be a, off the mm -hmm. top of my head. I should really have thought about that number beforehand. Um, but it was a good range of, of birds. I um, at this time of year in that, or, or that time of year in that habitat, then I'm actually birding by ear more than by sight, partly because my ears are better than my eyes, but also because the birds are kind of buried in vegetation. So um, it was quite a decent subset of the, the warblers that we see cruising through here in a few short weeks. It's almost spring migration again. Um, so a bunch of warblers. Um, several woodpeckers but not all of them so um sap suckers and flickers and pileateds were the most commonly encountered woodpeckers for us in our trip um quite a few ducks so common mergansers and the common and the common golden eyes that i showed you the picture of um and just a few individuals of a few other species we saw one pair of blue winged teal for example um and i think one or two pairs of ring neck ducks um not even many loons actually a few common loons but not that many um, and birds of prey is mostly broad-winged hawks and bald eagles, but we, we didn't encounter, but could have encountered golden eagles as well. They probably breed at that latitude. Um, so, and actually the, one of the fun things was um, we found quite a few sets of Canada jay families. So they actually breed 
much earlier in the year, in, in the winter, in fact. So by the time we were there, the chicks were like big and already able to fly and they were kind of following parents around, um, but they were black. So we could see that they were, weren't adult plumage. So it was really neat to see that life stage in that, in that species that you, you don't get to see very often. Yeah, that's great. Well, Jenna is asking if there were any wildlife species that you were hoping to see, but that didn't make an appearance. Oh, well, I always want to see a wolverine, obviously. Um, everyone needs to see a wolverine. Um, and I, I think that they are in there, that landscape. The other thing that we didn't, well, I actually saw one beside of, on the side of the road, um, but we didn't see any during the trip as a, a lynx. Um, that would be a real privilege to see mm. a lynx or, and or a wolverine in the wild doing their thing. And until then, I can just choose to believe that they don't really exist and that I'm not really missing out. And then I'll hopefully get to see one one day. <laughs> <laughs> John is asking if there are any invasive plant species up there in the park. That's a good question, John. Um, I did not see any. Um, I always keep an eagle eye out for non-native invasive phrygmites um, or common reed, the big grassy thing that you see growing along the highways in southern Ontario, because I'm always terrified that that's going to leap into these remote areas in northern Ontario. But I'm pleased to say we did not see any non-native phrygmites. Um, the, the boreal ecosystem in some ways is, is rel it almost seems like it's relatively robust to, to at least some of the common invasives that we see more often in southern Ontario. Um, and we were lucky we were in a fairly intact landscape. It was, it was subject mostly just to natural um, fire regimes and wind blowdown and things and doesn't get disturbed by, you know, lots of vehicles and things like that that can often be bringing in invasive species. Um, so it was... It was, it was very, very rewarding to see such a relatively intact ecosystem, in fact. But it's not, it's not immune to, to those threats. I mean, there's certainly any time you have encroachment around the edge or industrial activities around the edges or roads being constructed through places like that, then those are all really good conduits for invasive plants. John is also interested whether you encountered any blackbacked or three-toed woodpeckers in or near some of the forest fire areas in particular. I really wanted to, but I only managed to see one blackback woodpecker, which I didn't manage to get a photo of either. Um, so yeah, we spent a lot of time paddling through very well, recently and not so recently burned areas, which in some ways got a little bit tedious after a while. Um, and I was expecting to be, you know, knee deep in black backed and three toed woodpeckers, but we unfortunately were not. Um, that might have been partly the time of year. It was maybe a little bit later than they might have been vocalizing most. Um, we also ended up on a bit of a late schedule with our, our days. So I wasn't up and about super early in the morning when it might have been more productive for birding and like I tend to prefer to be out and about so um and then our first week of wind was not conducive to birding anyway so yeah next time maybe i think there's a few of us who are also really interested in uh, in the bugs <laughs> did you <laughs> did you see other than the luna moss did you see any particularly interesting bug species but also other than the the tent and the shelter you had how did you keep yourselves bug free during the day because yeah. I'm like you, if I encounter black flies, I, I swell horrendously, so I, I can commiserate on that. I, <laughs> I took a forest ecology class in, uh, in Sweden around the Arctic Circle once, and I couldn't get into my shoes for a week because <laughs> my feet were so swollen. <laughs> yeah, I, I can definitely sympathize. Um, so when we're actually paddling on the water, it wasn't too bad. Um, like I say, the first few days were really windy, so it wasn't buggy while we we're paddling. The middle point when it was hot, it actually got almost too hot for bugs for a while. So again, paddling, it was okay. Um, as soon as we were portage clearing or setting up and de deconstructing the camp each day, um, then we just wore kind of long sleeved shirts and pants. We had um, bug nets that we had on over our, our sun hats. Um, and we used a little bit of DEET, but didn't really need to use it that much, because um, with the long clothing, then it, it seemed to work pretty well. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, it, like, like in some ways, I kept thinking it could have been an awful lot worse bug-wise than it really was. And I'm sure I've yet to encounter a particularly obnoxious, buggy um, Northern Ontario experience, but it, it was certainly up there in the scheme of bugginess. Um, but in terms of, of other, other um, 
invertebrates like that. And I, I can't actually remember the names. I, I needed to dig up my photos again, but I did manage to photograph quite a few interesting dragonflies and dambleflies and things. Um, not super large numbers of those. Um, Again, the weather was kind of not super conducive to it and the habitats that we found ourselves in were not always super conducive to, to getting decent photos so I could ID those guys. Um, not too many butterflies as well, um, a few here and there as well, but um, not super abundant. And again, partly because we're kind of busy, <laughs> busy trying to survive and, and paddle quite a lot of the time. It didn't leave as much time for um, naturalizing as I might have preferred. Um, but you can look me up on iNaturalist and see all the species that I've currently apparently forgotten what I saw. <laughs> if you like, you can, yeah. see our, you can see my name and see our roots kind of etched out in iNaturalist observations in Wabakimi. <laughs> yeah, I, I noticed in the picture of the black bear, there was a fairly large flying insect kind of towards the right of his ear. And I was like, oh, I wonder what that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it was actually pretty funny when we were paddling on the Michika and the, the, the moose would kind of run away from us as we, we approached. And sometimes they'd leave behind a cloud of, of um, deer flies, which would then latch themselves onto us. So we'd be paddling along and the moose would disappear. The deer flies would come to us and we'd have to paddle harder to try and kind of paddle away from those deer flies. So that was kind of fun. <laughs> Yeah. I think there's a lot of people here in the chat who are quite thankful that you took them on this exciting trip without them actually <laughs> having having to go themselves. Uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be physically able to do it. So kudos to you for doing that. Uh, it must be a really intense, but also extremely fascinating experience. Like getting away from people like that is, is just such a, such a unique experience, I, I think, and being able to immerse yourself. So Dimiesha is asking sort of what is your biggest takeaway that you kind of learn from, from being on the land out there? Like what is in your understanding from the land from this trip? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's really hard to kind of put that into words. I think just getting a feel for that, that ecosystem is, you know, you can read stuff and you can look at photos and, and all that kind of stuff. And that's obviously really important as well. I don't pretend to have, any real expertise in this particular ecosystem in Ontario, but having spent a bunch of time stomping through it, you really get a, a kind of visceral feel for how it all hangs together. And it kind of makes sense that you see that species of plant on that type of soil, or you see it on that, that aspect or whatever. So just having that kind of better feel for, for how it hangs together and then starting to link that to kind of which birds I'm likely to be hearing in association with those plants is just these kind of general soft feelings that you get. Um, but definitely a, 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 a more visceral um, reaction to the need to conserve these kind of special places and not just the boreal ecosystem and the boreal ecosystem is incredibly important on a planetary scale to conserve but it, it sort of gives me a, a renewed enthusiasm and appreciation for conserving things like we're, we're all collectively doing in southern Ontario as well and with rare being a, a classic example of that but it's a completely different ecosystem there's arguably very little overlap ecologically in some levels but the the importance of it is is equal if not greater um, because it's so much more accessible for people you can visit there you can learn from it directly and conserving that kind of landscape is really important as well yeah um, and speaking of plants john is also asking if there were any notable orchids or erica sea that you ran into um, so I think I had a, a picture early on of the pink lady slipper orchids. They were stunning. I mean, they're, again, a fairly common, not even boreal. You don't even have to go that far north to see them in Ontario. But um, I don't get to see them every day down here in London. So I get a real kick out of seeing anything kind of orchidy like that. Um, and it was really interesting during the course of the trip. Um, time was passing, but we're also moving north throughout it. So it was interesting to observe the changes in phenology during that time. So right I think the very first time I, I saw them on the trip it was um it was one in absolutely beautiful condition perfect I have to get a photo of this and then two or three days there were orchids in beautiful condition and then they started to senesce and started to kind of not be very obvious so over the course of the trip and the latitude that we're traveling over then we actually observed that that kind of seasonality in plants same with the um uh, the bunchberry, which is another really even commoner boreal plant, is actually like a, a type of um, dogwood. It's a little ground hugging plant. And again, during the trip, there were peak condition and then all started to kind of look a bit sad towards the end of the trip. So, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. 
So, so Nina is, is asking and interested in your gear and did you treat your water and did you only use the stick stove or did you also take gas into there too? Yeah, good question. So we had a little stick stove, which we used a bunch for lunch. Um, so Brent makes a really nice bannock um, on that. So that was really good for lunch. Um, and you can, use, if you're not familiar with it, it's just four little, like a little four sided thing. It collapses down to be a flat little thing, a little pouch. And you just assemble it and it it really does what it says you need literally tiny tiny little twigs like the size of your finger or even less and a really small handful um allows you to either boil water or or cook something like a bannock for lunch so that was a really low impact way um to not always have to get the fuel bottle out um we're, we're we don't tend to build you know a big fire and we don't tend to fish and things like that we we like to minimize our, our footprint when we're traveling in these incredible places and that's that's one mechanism to do that um our main stove though was um with um it was an msr um i forget what species the stove is called um but with with fuel so we kind of measured out how much fuel we thought we would need and had a good kind of half bottle extra um in the event that the plane couldn't come and get us or we got stuck somewhere for a bit longer than we were expecting um so yeah a bit of a mixture can't remember if there's a second part to that question or not. No, I, I, th I, th I think I guess oh, okay. about the, if you, whether or not you treated the water. Oh yeah, water, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah so we did. Um, so we used a gravity filter. So it's actually a really simple device. You kind of fill like a, a flexible platypus thing with your lake water and it, you just hang it on a tree and it um, uses gravity to, to flow down through a filter. So it was a regular, um, whatever type of filter it is but then we had a, a carbon filter as well to remove any flavors because some of the water was <laughs> quite quite leaky in flavor um so we we had those two filters there and um so that that was great we could filter um i think six liters at a time so we'd kind of scoop out water in the middle of the lake before we'd get into to shore to the campsite hang it on a tree and then by the time i got the tent up then we had drinking water for the evening and, and into the morning um, we had backup and um, we had extra, a bit of extra fuel so we could boil water if we needed to, if that broke down for some reason. And we also had some um, little sterilization tablet things again as another backup. Because it's such a long trip, we wanted to have a little bit of redundancy in some of the more important bits of gear. Thank you. And Timi Isha is now also asking, uh, would you say that the length of the trip allowed you to yield the quality of information that you anticipated? And would you make now in hindsight any changes on how you collected the data? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so this was primarily a recreational trip with a bunch of voluntary data collection kind of thrown on the side. Um, when we've been in correspondence with the people that are running the Breeding Bird Atlas, for example, this year, and the, the trip that we were looking at prior to COVID making a resurgence in the north, um, it was very stripped down in terms of distance and landscape that we would cover because um, for those trips, we're expected to spend two or three nights in one place and go out and, and document birds in the morning at, at discrete um, predetermined locations. Um, so to do that properly, they really need a lot more time and you, you really also need to not be rolling into campsite at quarter to 10 at night so that you can still get up at four in the morning to get out for that peak time when the birds are singing in the morning. Um, so time on a, a trip where we're much more focused on, on data collection, then we'd cover a lot less ground, potentially do it with another set of people so that we could kind of share the load of some of the campsite logistics and stuff like that to leave us all a little bit more energy for actual data collection, things like that. Um, but for us, and, and my advice to all of you as well, if you're out and about, is um, you can make of it as much as you want. Um, any, any data point, especially if it's somewhere remote, is an incredibly valuable data point because it's an incredibly expensive one for, for example, in this case, provincial park staff to go and collect themselves. So if you're there anyway and you've been out for a few nights or even just for half an hour, then grab that data point because it's, it's definitely better than nothing. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for for sharing uh, sharing about this trip, Vari. I think that was was really interesting to to be able to see this through your eyes. Uh, because if we all would be going, it wouldn't be the same place any longer, right? So thank you so much for for bringing this experience to us here tonight.
Um, and with this, I would like to also thank everyone who joined us here tonight for this presentation. And uh, also big thanks to Chris Ainsworth and James Bow, who ran uh, the events organization and the tech here tonight. And if you enjoyed this event and would like to see more events like this, please visit our website, uh, rarsites.org and consider making a donation. And um, as always, all donations over $20 will receive an automatically generated tax receipt that will be straight uh, sent into your email inbox. So we hope to see you again at our next conversation for conservation, which is, uh, is hopefully um, is taking place uh, March 30th. If the date changes, we'll, we'll let you know and we'll be able to hopefully announce our next speaker shortly. And with this, thank you so much uh, for being here tonight. And thank you again, Vari, for this presentation. Thanks so much for having me.